Hello everyone and welcome to Blank First Page. My name is Lucas. In this video, we will be doing a flip through of this field notes. So I've got a couple of notebooks which I call long-term or reference notebooks. And these are notebooks in which I put information that I want to refer to beyond my basic everyday carry notebook. They will also contain information that will outlast the four or six weeks that I tend to use my pocket notebook for. So these type of reference or long-term notebooks house a few different types of information and this particular one houses my food recipes and cooking techniques. So this is a field notes. It is part of the ambition set, which was a quarterly edition from around 2017, I think. It came in this pack of three. It has gilded edges and it also has different innards. So this particular one is an unmarked calendar. So you can start it and stop it and finish it whenever you want. Haven't used that yet. This green one is a ledger type and I use it for my long-term list of books to read and some years I also use it to track the books that I have read. This one is a graph lined notebook and it contains all my kitchen information. For both of these reference notebooks I use a pencil. At the moment it is a Blackwing natural pencil and I made this leather point protector for it. The reason I use pencil is that these notebooks are being filled over the course of many years and my pens and inks and so on are going to change but pencils for the most part are going to remain pretty consistent and I have a supply of these particular pencils that will probably last my lifetime so I have no risk of running out and also pencil is a counterintuitively good instrument to use for long-term use. Pencil can survive things like water damage. The act of pushing into paper with a pencil leaves a bit more of a mark than you get with a pen. So for long-term purposes, a pencil is a good choice. So this notebook lives in the kitchen for the most part. The cover definitely has evidence of being used. Um, a lot of the notes in here relate to my bread and pizza recipes and you can see the various remnants of dough that has hardened into the cover. There's the requisite cooking oil splatters and spills which you'll find on any recipe book worth its salt I guess. So let's look into this notebook. I started it back in 2018 in Melbourne and this notebook has been with me in four of the six countries that I've lived in. Blank first page of course and the contents are largely recipes but there's a few cooking techniques as well. The first thing in here is a sourdough starter recipe. At this point in 2018 I had been making sourdough bread for two solid years and if you've made sourdough before you know that the starter which is basically the rising agent it's just a mixture of water and flour and the natural bacteria in the air that part is the most critical thing of the entire recipe it can be quite finicky it takes a lot of learning to get the procedure just right so once I had landed on a good recipe and a good process I wrote it down then of course there's a recipe for a standard white flour sourdough. Here I've got a recipe for a one day bake uh, based on an ambient temperature between 20 and 30 degrees. Not a recipe I use very much because the flavor of sourdough is just way better if you go over many days if you let the dough ferment over multiple days which is what I have here and this again is specific to a 20 to 30 degree ambient temperature. Then I've got a winter version I'm taking note of the temperature at night and also during the day because you can leave the dough out overnight so that is an important factor. And then I've got some variants that I make with different flours. Then the next best thing to a full sourdough loaf is of course sourdough pizza and Here's my recipe for that. My recipe has evolved a bit since then, so this may be due for a bit of an update, but the fundamentals and the process are still valid. 
I've got a quick reference for making a base tomato sauce. This came around because at the peak of summer, I like buying a bunch of tomatoes. They are very cheap and they are really delicious. So a great way to preserve them is to make sauce for long-term storage, kind of to last you through the winter months. Now we get into some of the ferments that I like making. Some of these I've kept up throughout the years. Some of these have fallen by the wayside, as I'll talk about. Fermented garlic honey. If you love garlic, this is an amazing condiment to have. It turns honey into a much looser syrup kind of thing, and it makes it more savory. So it is something you can use on salads, as a pizza topping, on bread with cheese. It's just amazing and super simple to make. Sauerkraut, haven't made that in a while. Tapache, that is the best version of a soft drink that exists. It's a Mexican fermented pineapple drink. You can put like chilies and ginger and it becomes this naturally carbonated, extremely tasty drink. Instructions continued. You do need a bit more equipment and a few large vessels to ferment this in, but it's worth the time. Something that is not worth the time, in my opinion, is kombucha. I tried it for a few months. I thought I was going to stick with it, but it was just too much hassle for me. Danish pickled cucumbers. This I got because my wife and I went to a rye bread making workshop at the Melbourne Museum. And at the end of this workshop, there was a sample menu of all these rye breads to taste. And one of the toppings was just this basic pickled cucumber in the Danish style. It just has a few specific additions, but it is the perfect crunchy, slightly acidic topping for like a cream cheese open-faced sandwich. Uh, unbelievable. I need to make those again. Then I've got a recipe for these Maltese peppered cheeselets, and they're called Jubaniet in Maltese. And um, they're traditionally a sheep's milk cheese, and they're kind of small in diameter, probably about five to 10 centimeters wide. And they're pretty much a ricotta type cheese that you can stop at various stages of softness. Um, and my favorite is when you let them dry out for a long time, you then coat them in pepper and then you pickle the cheese in vinegar. And it sounds super weird, but it is one of the best cheeses there is out there. Dutch baby, this is the best kind of pancake that exists and thank you to chef john from food wishes for his recipe with this it comes together in a blender i make it in a nutribullet it's so quick to make i just make it in 15 20 minutes even after dinner and i mostly have it sweet you can have it different savory ways as well but with just some sprinkled sugar or some nutella on it fantastic then there's the first of the specific te cooking techniques here, the reverse sear, a great way of guaranteeing a properly cooked steak, kind of cooked evenly the way through with a thin crust on the outside. You don't risk overcooking the inside by searing it too much on the outside. Here's an updated sourdough pizza recipe. I did come back and update it with my revised recipe. Standard sourdough revisited. What started out as my standard was basically just a white loaf. And for the last probably two to three years, I've been making it always with some whole wheat and some spelt. So I updated my recipe a bit to reflect that. Sourdough baguettes. I wish I could make these more frequently. It just I have not had quite the right oven to make these properly. This is my Oma's, my Austrian grandmother's apple cake. It's kind of an apple crumble, I guess. I'm not sure what the technical baking term is. In German, it's Apfelkuchen, but this is very much a nostalgic recipe for me. Um, I just remember when we were kids going to my grandmother in Austria and she would always have this cake in winter in particular. And so a few years ago when I was there visiting, I asked for her old recipe book and I copied it down into my own uh, long-term reference book. And then at the very end, I've just got a pita recipe, which I've been making a bit more recently. Works great with curries and various Middle Eastern foods uh, as well that I, that I love making. And I do have one addition to make right now, and that is for a Basque burnt cheesecake. If you've never heard of it, look it up. It is the easiest type of cheesecake to make. It takes, I don't know, probably 10, 15 minutes to prepare. Uh, you don't have to worry about all the usual crap with 
a cheesecake water baths and getting temperature just right. The intention is to burn it. You kind of caramelize the outside, it doesn't quite burn, but you get this interesting bitter taste which offsets nicely the rich sweetness of the cheesecake. I'll add that recipe in now so that I've got it to hand when I need it next, which I am sure will be soon. All right, so that is my recipe reference book. Maybe it inspired you to start your own, collect a few of your own and your family's recipes in a nice notebook. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.